Well, with all that dealt with, now we're done for the moment. They need to get six hours of shut-eye before they go to the next part. Can't make any stupid mistakes in your exhaustion. Want to avoid that blindness thing, remember? They head off to sleep, and Robert Wise continues his creative approach, using the multi-image format to have the characters consider some of the events that Crichton had brought up in his book. The evidence of microscopic life forms in a meteorite, or discussion about microscopic life also being intelligent. As for Hall, he just falls asleep at his desk until awakened by a woman's voice. Do you wish something, sir? Your name. Will that be all, sir? For the moment. I should tell you, I'm the most disease-free man you'd ever do it with. Well, the voice belongs to Miss Gladys Stevens, who is 63 years old. She lives in Omaha and makes her living taping messages for voice reminder systems. So much for single men making the right decisions. He shows up for what we'll charitably call breakfast, a glass of nutrients that taste like orange juice. And later on, they won't even get that, just supplements to ensure there's nothing that could be used as a growth medium for any microscopic organism. Fun work, isn't it? Stop by your rooms and insert these before taking the elevator. I have risk drowning in that foul bath. I have been parboiled, irradiated, and xenon flashed. And now you suggest I... I have to. We haven't done anything about the GI tract yet. You're going to be sticking more solid things in your butt than in your mouth on this trip. But yeah, the intention is to completely remove any microscopic organisms from the body, even on the inside, so cleaning out the GI tract is part of it. But yeah, now that they've gotten to the, um, bottom of things, we can get to work on what we came here for, studying and dealing with an alien microbe. That includes the two survivors. Hall will be handling that alongside a nurse. But first, it's time to science that bug right in the face. If the patients are sealed off, how do I get to them? Ever used a glove box? No. Wildfire's going to step further. Great, so I'll be even more clueless on how it works. Thanks. One of those rooms is the one that we're about to enter, where using robotic arms, Stone is able to open up the satellite and then puts a rat in there. In the room, I mean, not inside the satellite. He's not trying to do some adorable little rats in space calendar or something. No, sir, they are not making a calendar out of these images. Not unless it's for the Kids Cry All Year Long series. Let's try a Reese's. Yeah, a little time on the merry-go-round should cheer everybody right up. So they bring out the monkey, and it too buys it quickly. To get the performance out of the monkey, they had the ASPCA observe while flooding the chamber with CO2, and then once it passed out, they immediately revived it with a scuba tank. The rat is unconfirmed, though to speculate, I'd say they probably did something similar. I mean, why go to all the trouble to introduce a definitely lethal option when the room is already set up to do a non-lethal one? I mean, they could have injected it with something, perhaps, but it's not as if CO2 is so expensive that it'd be easier to mess around with poisons and then wait for the rat to die. The animals are sent off for post-mortems, since it's a little late for any other option. Giving the monkey a nose job at this point would just be a waste. There's a little tension between Levitt and Hall, who, as you saw, is not silent in her contempt for him. Nelson Getting, who adapted the book into the screenplay, suggested making Levitt female, although that was met with some initial resistance. Not for the reasons you think, though. The image was of Raquel Welch in Fantastic Voyage, and they wanted to avoid anything like that, so Getting had to make clear that that wasn't what he was thinking at all. He didn't want to go in the direction of cheesecake. Levitt or Dutton were the only real options as far as replacement goes, because realistically, well... There is no way in 1970 they would put this massive government project under the control of a woman. And there was no way Hollywood was going to have its final action sequence be in the hands of a woman either. Hey, don't blame me. I have always admired Princess Leia, and I don't mean in a chainmail bikini. So, that just left the other two then. Of them, Levitt was the more interesting choice, because Dutton was mild-mannered, but Levitt was an outside-the-box thinker with a secret. Adding conflict by making her misanthropic allows the character to be more interesting and a contrast to the older and subdued Dutton. 
I realize she may rub some people the wrong way. I really do. I, I, I just remind myself of how I feel about early Loaxana Troy, and I get how overbearing acerbicness can be insufferable. But in this case, I really enjoyed the dynamic that she presented here. Anyway, Hall is taking a look at his patients with the help of the nurse, who's already waiting down there, saying that she's already followed the instructions of the computer, which analyzed the two subjects. Not to worry, the baby's been getting nutrition, although he's still squawking up a storm. Kids got lungs that would put Pavarotti to shame. The nurse explains that this is all new for them as well, that until now, this wasn't real, it was just a game to them, an ongoing exercise to see how they could handle this stuff, but they'd never faced a real deadly disease. But now, woof, this might be the bug with your name on it. I just really hope it was meant for somebody else named Chuck. Actually, now that I think about it, it would be ironic if Chuck Norris wound up taking my place for COVID-19. I mean, I don't wish harm on anyone, but that would be a bizarre final note, wouldn't it? For someone memed into being the most indestructible man to then die of COVID? Then again, if the world learned that Chuck Norris could be killed by this disease, I think a lot of people on the internet would never stop washing their hands. Anyway, she shows him how to crawl into the suit tunnel to go inspect his patients, while elsewhere, Levitt and Stone are using the microscope to examine the satellite looking for the disease. I'll call it Andromeda for simplicity, even though it hasn't technically been named yet. There's conflict between the two of them. Stone wants to do it slow, steady, and by the book, while she wants to speed the process along by going straight to the inside, since that's where the scoop is most likely to, well, scoop things. But the subtext of their argument speaks to the difference of their viewpoints. Stone is trying to approach this as just another academic problem. But Levitt sees it in light of the moral implications of wildfire being the fire extinguisher, while Scoop carelessly plays with matches. Dutton's experiments with the dead rat demonstrate that it's definitely airborne. The disease, not the rat. So they start using filters to determine how big Andromeda is, if it's just a tiny molecule, or if it's the size of a virus, or even a bacteria. It's just a matter of seeing how big the pores need to be to allow it through to kill another rat. Don't feel guilty, I have it on good authority, these animals being experimented with deserve it. This rat is here for armed robbery, and the monkey was picked up for possession with intent. When they talk about having a monkey on your back, this is the monkey they meant. While Dutton sorts out the size, Hall gets on with his examination of the old man, Jackson, finally getting the old codger to respond at least a little bit, but is interrupted by Dutton. They're going to test how Andromeda gets into the body. Do you expect me to talk, Stone? No, Mr. Monkey, I expect you to die. Scanning during the infection process reveals the monkey was first infected in the lungs, then it spread outward through the rest of the body. So they know about how big it is, that it travels through the air, you breathe it in, it clots your blood from the core outward, and that's all she wrote. So, now to find the damn thing. Like with Clue, you may know the where and the how, but you still need to find the who. Scanning the inside of Scoop reveals a micrometeorite the size of a grain of sand, covered in green stuff. While zoomed in, Levitt sees the thing grow. I mean, once they've zoomed in, not during the process. If it didn't grow while they were zooming in, I would be concerned. Problem was that Stone wasn't looking when that happened. She's not sure she can trust her eyes. Not after working for so long, fueled solely by nutrient juice and whatever she's been told to stuff in her butt. Fortunately, the next time Stone is there to corroborate it, so they're seeing in real time signs of growth, suggestive of a life form, naturally. So they use the robot hands to grab a sample of the stuff. The robot gets cancer, so you don't have to. Over with the patients, Hall is annoyed that the computer can only tell him that Jackson's blood is acidic, but not why. So when Jackson is finally at least somewhat lucid, he says he has an ulcer, which he treats with aspirin and sterno, but well, that's about it. Oh, and he wants to smoke, but they won't let him, which is a surprise, because I thought in the 70s smoking was mandatory, along with shag and long hair with mustaches. Elsewhere, 
Things disintegrating is not a problem you want to have 10,000 feet off the ground and going the speed of sound. That's the pilot equivalent of sitting down after Taco Bell and discovering there's one square of toilet paper left on the roll. We're agreed, then. We'll imply the plane crash rather than wasting money showing it happen on the film. Manchik is wondering why Wildfire has been so silent about all these goings-on, especially over the president choosing not to nuke Piedmont off the map. As they later learn, it's because a piece of paper wound up between the striker and the bell, so no one heard it go off when a message would come in. The guy upstairs tested the system, everything was working fine, so all he can do is shrug. As established, that is part of his job. The rest of the team is hard at work. Is the paint mixer nearly done? I'd like to get these drab walls dealt with before the carpeting arrives. They're putting the sample of the rock itself into a mass spectrometer to determine what it's made of, and what they find is that it's a kind of plastic. Theoretically, it could be a natural accident, but since it's serving as a delivery vehicle for what is seeming more and more like a living thing, that's not easy to swallow. The big strike against this being a living thing, though, is the absence of any form of organic material, despite being made of the atoms that make up organic compounds. It's like having all the parts of an airplane together in a jumble, and yet somehow the jumble is still capable of flight. Oh, perhaps that was a poor analogy, because we've arrived at the crash site for that poor bastard where they find his bones so clean they look polished. As I mentioned with the book, this seems to be a point that goes nowhere, because as we'll see, Andromeda's new form is no longer directly harmful to humans, so showing it as a flesh-devouring monster seems to kind of be the exact opposite, don't you think? Mention is made that the rubber scene breaking down is actually kind of plastic, and the remark is made that it's similar in some ways to human skin, to perhaps explain away this problem. But I still fail to see how we can breathe a sigh of relief when the bug has gone from causing instantaneous blood clotting to consuming human flesh. No one hears that we'll have the flesh strip from our bones and just wipe their foreheads. Phew! Finally, some good news. Incidentally, and this is the most unimportant thing I could possibly bring up, but it's just gnawing at me. Peter Hobbs plays the general. It's a fluke, a vibration effect, maybe. Let's get up there. Well, it looks picked clean, almost like it was polished. That's right. Well, I don't get it. Or maybe a microorganism. Meaning? And he sounds just like the character Commander Prodigy from the original Star Wars. Lord Vader, the battle station plans are not aboard this ship, and no transmissions were made. An escape pod was jettisoned during the fighting, but no life forms were aboard. Because Prodigy was dubbed by an unknown American actor, it's been making me wonder every time he opens his mouth if we found the guy who does the voice. I know, I know, it's not important. It's just when I get the feeling I recognize someone, I have to go check to see why. It's like my brain has a broken tooth that needs to be fixed. <laughs> 